morning and welcome to our event today. Uh, before I start, uh, I'm just going to run through a little bit of housekeeping while people are coming into uh, our virtual room. Uh, so my name's Emma Waddingham. I am the editor of Legal News Wales and your host today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping for you. So we are recording this event as we have the previous events in our Workplace Config series. Uh, so with that in mind, if I can ask you all to stay on mute, uh, we will hopefully have some time for questions later where I can um, invite you to unmute yourself. And that means that the recording will focus on the speaker. So you won't be picked up um, no matter how uh, you appear um, on your screen, it'll only be the speakers that are on the recording. Um, the uh, recording obviously will be available for you to view and to share and the whole series will be available as well, uh, but we are publishing them with a bit of a time lapse so obviously if these are th things that are pertinent to your uh, uh, industry at the moment then I think it's really important to attend the events and obviously tap into um, the expertise of our speakers here today. Um, there is a chat function so that speech bubble at the bottom if you're on a desktop. Um, if you want to communicate with myself Emma um, or my co-host Alison love um, just pop us a message they are uh, to host only I'm afraid so no conversation between um, the uh, members of the audience um, but we can pick up on those um, any reflections on what somebody said or any questions that you would like me to ask um, if you don't want to put your hand up later um, just pop them in there uh, the doors will stay open so if you fall out you'll come back in again um, and uh, I think that's probably about um, all the housekeeping that I have for uh, for the time being um, short of saying that all the contact details and signposting and things will also um, be shared after the event as well. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for our second event in our Workplace Conflict series, delivered in partnership with the Civil Mediation Council. Workplace conflict appears to be on the rise uh, and there are some very difficult and potentially contentious issues set to um, arise for employers as they return to the workplace and as we tran transition into new and different ways of working. And of course, one of those variants is hybrid working, which is the focus of our event today. Over half of employees in the UK are said to want to retain some form of working from home. Some organisations seem set to embrace this and others are demanding a full return to office working. Whatever the approach, there are likely to be some difficulties arising on how this is managed in a fair and equitable way and in a way that satisfies competing and different views and the needs of the businesses and what works for some employees will not work for all. That conflict is of course our focus here today. And it's for us to share experiences and useful insight from our panel of employers, HR managers, mediators and an employment lawyer to help you and your clients avoid, manage and remedy disputes, positively empowering both employees and employers. So today in our second event, I'm joined by a fresh panel of speakers. Um, I'm going to welcome Tracy Dickinson, who is the head of HR at the Vale of Glamorgan Council. Phil Sace, a lecturer at UWE and the chair of the UCU, Alison Love, Managing Director at Resolution at Work, and David Winkup, Employment Lawyer with Squire Patton Box. So to start, I'm going to ask my panel to take a 60 second or less introduction challenge um, to uh, welcome yourselves, uh, introduce yourselves to our audience and tell us why you're here um, and perhaps what you're looking forward to covering um, in this event. So I'd like to ask Tracy uh, to go first, please. Hi, thank you very much, Emma. Can you all hear me okay? Firstly, so um, hello and welcome. So yeah, as um, Emma says, my name is Tracy Dickinson and I'm the head of HR and OD at the Vale of Morgan Council. Um, my previous experience has been in uh, both local government and also in private and commercial sectors. So I've worked for Brains Brewery, um, Network Rail and British Airways before joining the Vale. Um, I joined the Vale uh, just as the pandemic hit. <clears throat> So a bit of a baptism of, of fire there. Um, I'd been with the Vale for about three months before um, March 2020 and therefore um, have worked uh, with the Vale Council across probably one of its most testing periods um, that it has seen and one of the most testing periods for us from a, a HR and, and people perspective. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here today is hybrid working is something that we as a local authority are considering. Um, and considering moving into from sort of April 2022 um, and we've had a lot of engagements with our staff groups to look at what it is that's important to them at this point 
so really interested to hear all of the, the views that the group have today. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Philip, can I ask you to come forward, please? Yes, thanks. Uh, morning, all. Uh, I'm Phil Sace. I am the, uh, 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 as Emma said, I'm the chair of our local UCU branch and also the Southwest Region HE uh, Committee. Uh, the, one of the one of the issues that we face at the moment is having had such a big disruptor to the way that we work and the way that we deliver services, for want of a better word. Um, it, it's clear now that the world will never be the same again for us. Um, hybrid working is going to be and has for professional staff, so academic staff at universities for a long time, hybrid working has been somewhat of the norm. However, and an expectation of staff, actually, I have to say. Uh, but what's got really clear now is that um, there seems to be a, a, a wish and a desire for that hybrid working to be more formalised in the contractual arrangements between staff and and and, um, and universities, and and I suspect that is being played out across across industries. Um, why am I here today? I'm very passionate about having mediation early um, and recognising there's always be a, a place for mediation at the end of. Um, at the end of formal processes, um, just really trying to trying to promote um, uh, and, and get the word out about mediation being before processes, um, so that staff and managers can speak to each other uh, in safe spaces um, and and get resolution that works for them very very easily and quickly, um, as opposed to lots of form filling and rubber stamping. And David will probably wince at that 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 thought. Thank you. That's perfect. And I think that some of those um, difficulties are going to play out during the course of the event. Um, so, David, um, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself now, please. Yes, I'm David Wincup. I'm Head of Employment at Squire Pat and Boggs in London. Uh, I'm here for two reasons. Firstly, because there is actually quite a lot of law around the hybrid working. It's the old flexible working regime. Um, come alive in a way that it hasn't before uh, but also I'm here as mediator I've been a mediator for 15 years or something uh, and you watch the employment tribunal struggling already with the workload that they've got it's my view that just based on questions I'm asked by clients all the time that hybrid working and the pull to and from the office is going to generate a lot of heat and light in the employee relations field. I don't think the employment tribunals with all the respect in the world are up to it logistically, uh, nor should it need to go that far. I think mediation has a big part to play in resolving the sort of disputes that we're getting out of hybrid working. So I'm wearing two hats today. That's never a problem. Thank you very much. And, um, and Alison Love, who returns uh, to this event and is one of our uh, collaborators as well. Um, Alison, could you uh, introduce yourself, please? OK, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I following on really from what Phil and um, David has said, I'm a, I'm a passionate convert. I describe myself as a passionate convert to the benefits of uh, mediation and, and informal conflict resolution. Um, I've got a background in both a um, very long time ago, HR uh, and employment law. Um, so I've seen firsthand the damage that formal and legal processes can bring. There's, there's really no real winners, um, huge amounts of wasted time, cost, impact on people's well-being um, and, and so on. Um, and I suppose I'm here really to help spread the word. Um, I still feel that mediation and informal conflict resolution is not used enough, um, as, as Phil said, you know, at early enough st stages uh, and, and so on. Um, and I still feel that there's a lack of understanding of what mediation really is and what it isn't um, and, and the benefits of so on. Um, and I'm also um, a firm believer that conflict resolution skills are a vital management and leadership tool um, that can do a lot to um, resolve things at a very early stage, even before you get into sort of informal resolution uh, and mediation. 
Thank you, Alison. And there's a sense that we're all um, stepping into a whole bit of a new world here and in a very different way um, than, than pre-pandemic. And I think with that in mind, it'd be really useful to go through to uh, all the panel and ask you what, the, what you think the top most interesting concerns are that you've come across in recent experiences in the terms of the move to hybrid working or the way that we were, are working in what we're hoping will be a post-pandemic and beyond um, restructuring of the workplace. Um, uh, Phil, I'd like to ask you first, please. I'm the first of the day to unpress, not to, to, to fail to press, shall I say. Um, yeah, uh, this is a, a huge but interesting question, I think, and there are so many different angles to take. But one of the reflections I've had um, over what we should re return to campus or return to workplace working is how uh, people have rebalanced their priorities and uh, some of the priorities which are outside of work have really uh, come to the fore and that and I think that one of the challenges is to rebalance that we think about childcare, but we also think about caring um, and actually who we live with and who we socialize with so those that are more vulnerable um, and how how I as an individual can protect them while engaging in work and life and all of those things. So I think that's that's uh, that's the biggest uh, change I've seen is how people are presenting their own personal lives as a priority in in uh, in accommodating work into it. Thank you, and Tracy. Hey, thanks. Um, I think uh, we've always been very people centred and um, some of our Maybe. biggest challenge, as you would imagine, across the, the last 20 months or so has been ensuring that we continue to deliver the services to the communities that we serve. Um, and therefore, as a workforce, we are um, very different. So we've got a population that predominantly have had to work from home under Welsh Government guidance. Um, because that is the guidance that's been given for us and they've had to work in a very different way. We've also had a sizable part of our um, staff workforce that can't work in uh, from home or in a hybrid way and um, are, they're either our, our social care teams or our waste crews or our teaching professions. Um, so the, the challenge for us really has been um, considering all in, in that mix and and I suppose one of the biggest learnings for me professionally in the past has been ensuring that we engage and communicate with everyone, not just those that, that this might be potentially impacting in terms of ensuring we get uh, views and involvement and input from everybody. Um, and I know there's a, there's a question later, but uh, certainly for us, one of the, the main things that we have done is ensure that we engage with the groups that are frontline um, and that, uh, you know, for them, this isn't an opportunity. And, and, and how can we look at things and doing things a little bit differently? We've also been fundamentally concerned around our employee wellbeing, um, social isolation, um, and how people feel with uh, the, the stark change that we all had to go through to working very collaboratively in office spaces when spontaneous conversation was taking place to all work in the manner in which we're doing now and, and how we ensure that um, we can engage. So those have probably been two of the biggest um, uh, kind of issues for us and, and they played out in our regular employee surveys that we've taken it across the piece. And, and probably a slight aside for us as well, but nevertheless very important, is how we induct our staff into a very new way of working and certainly um, feedback from new employees for us has been that's a real challenge it's really difficult to integrate themselves into a workforce where they don't see anyone um, other than virtually for months and months on end so i i would say employee well-being how we deal with a uh, workforce that, that's very different it isn't just all uh, working from home and how we look at aspects around inclusion for people um, who, who may be new starters to the organisation or spread the a little bit. Absolutely, thank you. And I know we'll touch on a lot of that later as well, Tracy, thank you. Um, David, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, I've, I've got three single most important things to that have come up. These, these are more from the employer side than the employee wellbeing side. 
uh, the, the issue is that the balance of power has changed around home working because pre-pandemic, uh, it was something you had to ask for and show would work essentially in practice anyway. Um, now it's been shown that it works and it's for the employer to find reasons to unpick it. And we, we're getting a lot of questions around the soft skills impacts of people working at home in terms of collegiality and their ability to manage juniors and not things which mean that on any given day you can't do your job, but which have a prospectively serious and long-term impact on especially the development of junior staff. Uh, even, even within my own firm, it is an issue. Uh, and the, the question is always, are they tangible enough? Are they important enough for the employer simply to say no? Uh, there isn't a clear answer to that. There won't be a single answer. Uh, but that, that's one of my things. The second is the interplay with being vaccinated or not. Uh, that's a very large topic and extremely emotive. And we, we see what's happening across Europe in terms of increasing degrees of compulsion there. I don't think that will come to the UK, but it remains to be seen. Uh, and the third one is the biggest question of all, which I very much hope we don't get to today because it, it is too big, which is the question of what happens to your salary if you are working from home in London, for example, when you might as well be working from home from somewhere else cheaper in the country or even abroad. Why should you continue to get a London salary if you're not there? Uh, and there isn't a, a, a very good answer to that, uh, frankly. Uh, and there's a lot of time and thought going to have to go into the interplay between hybrid working and money. Uh, that, that's a, a topic for another day, but it, it's a serious question. And it just goes to show how much employers are having to juggle and think about. And as one decision is made, it has a, an impact on, on, on something else. And it's, it sounds like a constant battle um, and perhaps something that, that is going to take a long time before any formal process is made. But um, what I'm also really interested, thank you to you all. So Alison as well, um, I'd like to, have you got anything that, that, that you'd like to add? I know they've covered quite a lot, the others have covered quite a lot there. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few things that, um, um, I've certainly come across or we've come across in terms of mediations that we've conducted that people have already sort of talked about so the difficulties for people to have established you know an effective working relationship because they're working virtually the whole time um, issues around sort of vaccination and not wearing masks and and, and, and this kind of thing but I, I think for me the, the the most important thing or the most significant thing I think that we're reflecting on is we're certainly seeing more um, conflict arising, more uh, requests for mediation and conflict resolution and so on. Um, and I think we're seeing much more or many more situations where one or other party um, has had an impact on their well-being and their mental health in particular. Um, and our reflections are that, um, you know, people's, people, people have been through very challenging times, you know, very different for different people, um, but there is an increase in people's kind of an anxiety levels, um, you know, worries, mental health, uh, and so on. And I think that is impacting on how people react and respond in terms of the way they communicate with each other and so on, and is... Um, not creating conflict, but but it but it's impacting on it and escalating it in ways that perhaps um, wouldn't have happened sort of pre-pandemic so quickly. Absolutely, thank you. And I know I often say that I come across um, in person and and verbally better than perhaps sometimes on email. People can misunderstand something, and I suspect you know Teams chats have only probably um, escalated that um, uh, potential conflict as well or misunderstandings. Um, 
I'm interested in the idea. I mean, you've, we've read a lot. Um, we've all read a lot on this issue, I'm sure. Um, and the idea that that hybrid working may well be the kind of the panacea uh, to reframing um, the workplace. But um, Phil, I, I wondered if if you had anything to share, particularly from your experience, that is the concept of the move to hybrid working. Is it reframing issues that were pre-pandemic um, as well as new issues? And and on that basis, if you, if they have, have they got bigger? Has it escalated? Um, the problem and perhaps why are they cropping up now if not before? Okay, uh, yeah, so again, a lot in that question. I think that there has been, um, so so are they new issues or are they issues that have come from uh, from before? I think there's a bit of a mixture, um, uh, but generally uh, where we're seeing uh, people coming to us for advice and support, um, they are there are issues around trust that have always been there, issues around communication that have always been there, with an interplay between obviously the managers and the reports that those managers have. So I think um, pre-pandemic, we would often see lots of conversations and, 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 and requests for advice around how am I going to do with my manager who's doing this? How I don't want to use formal processes. I don't want them to know that I've come to the union. I don't want them to know that um, you know I'm talking about problems I've, or anyone to know that I'm talking about problems with my managers. Um, and we would give advice on how to manage the manager and have those open conversations and encourage them to do it. But staff felt very uncomfortable about that um, for fears that were often arguably not, not, not really there. Um, you know that, that I will be victimized more or and there was no evidence around that that being necessarily the case in 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 in, in their instances so I think that we're seeing we had a reprieve from that at the beginning of pandemic because it was a disruptor so managers were being disrupted in the way that they had to communicate or they were communicating with their staff staff were um, uh, disrupted in the way that they were communicating with the managers and it relied an awful lot on trust so in our sector we were very much being can you just do what you can you know if that's over and above what you were doing before that's fine if that's not quite the same then that's not fine so it was a very kind uh, measures of communication going out and pleas for help and and to muck in um, and that changed halfway through the pandemic to go now it's our expectation that you will work like this and of course we've come now to what I would tentatively call post-lockdown um, Britain, where we are seeing people reverting back to those, well, now I expect you to be in the office. Um, and those managers that were being accused often of micromanaging and of those bullying behaviours at relatively low levels, um, that's causing an anxiety amongst the staff that were asking for support or were coming forward or likely to be coming forward to us to now going i'm going to have to go back into that environment and i don't want to do it uh, and of course staff workers employees have more choices available to them now and that's rebalancing some of the power uh, that's going on so i think that there are there are issues that we've had in the past that people had a reprieve from working at a distance from people. Uh, we're now seeing anxieties where those people are being encouraged, uh, sometimes uh, encouraged very assertively to come back into the office um, uh, as being a function of, of pre-pandemic relationships. There are new things, there are new issues to be dealt with, but I think that they are generally um, from from my uh, experience, they are generally issues that existed pre-pandemic, which are just come to the fore because the pace of change has become uh, quite quick in a return to the work or to talk about hybrid working or talk about how my how my pl my place in this organisation is going to go forward. And of course, the balance of power is um, has changed, and there's no doubt about that. So um, I think old issues, uh, sorry, old old patterns of behaviour apply to new issues. Um, I would say is the is the is the headline there. Thank you, um, David. Is there anything that you have uh, or would like to reflect on in terms of what Phil's just said? Yes, I I sort of think it's the other way round that it isn't that the lockdown has necessarily been a, a reprieve, but that it's been an opportunity for people who were already a bit miserable to sit and 
fester away by themselves uh, and magnifying whatever unhappiness they'd got. Uh, and we're, we're seeing, as Phil says, a, a reluctance to come back, but because of things which weren't really significant on the way into pandemic, but have come grown during it. Uh, and so we, we, we see that there's not really any new issues per se, but that some little old ones have grown because they haven't had the sort of moderating impact of daily interactions with colleagues to knock the corners off them and so on. Uh, and so it, it, some, some of the grievances that we're dealing with for, for clients revolve around the, the tiniest grain of sand in the oyster, if you like, and it's just got bigger and bigger and bigger because they've had nobody to talk to and nobody to bounce stuff off. Uh, but are there a lot of people who are bent out of shape one way or another by, by what's gone on? Yes, absolutely there are. And I think mediation has a, a much bigger part to play in that than is generally credited. Thank you, David. Um, and it's that notion again of the lack of the water cooler moment, isn't it? I, I've talked about it in lots of other events for different reasons and well-being always comes back to it um, and that ability to kind of thrash out some some of the problems um, you know, <laughs> discreetly amongst colleagues, I suppose. Um, Tracy, uh, you had your hand up here. Is there something you'd like to add as well, please? Yeah, I was just going to uh, come in on sort of Phil's point and, and also David's point just around a sort of balance of power, if, if you want to call it as such. But certainly what we've seen um, is that we, lots of people have tended to look at greater opportunities that perhaps weren't there in, in the past as well. So um, certainly for us, we've seen an, an increase in people who are applying to work for us from sort of out of region. Um, and we're also seeing the kind of flip side of that where uh, some of our uh, workforce are choosing to go and apply for roles that they would not have considered in the past. And, and that's because of the, of the opportunity for hybrid working presents them with uh, reduced travel, but the, the coverage of a greater geographic area that, that, that they perhaps would not have considered in the past. So that's given us some challenges from a succession planning perspective and, and kind of looking at a wider geography, which perhaps we didn't do in the past. That's not to detract from the kind of conversation around the, the real importance of in engagement, communication and mediation. Um, but I think, it, you know, if there are often individuals within an organisation who culturally are quite happy, but are, are seeking an opportunity to further their career in a space that just isn't available to them uh, in the current workforce as well. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, Alison. To unmute, sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to sort of follow on from what Phil and David were, were saying, really. In a true mediator style, I can see both their perspectives. Um, <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to kind of follow on from what David was saying, really, and, you know, that, that I make the point that mediation is a perfect opportunity to have the forum, the, the, the safe, confidential space to sort of talk through these issues, because what we talk about as mediators is, you know, what people are arguing about at the sort of top level, what we call the positions that people take, is very often not the real issues and not the things that are really important to people. And we talk about um, a concept of sort of needs and interests. Um, and those are the things underneath the position statements that people have taken that are the really important things to us as kind of human beings. So in the context of hybrid working, the position statement or the positions would be, you know, perhaps from the employee that, you know, I want to work from home or I don't want to work from home or I want to work in a particular pattern. Uh, and the employer saying, well, actually, you can't do that for business reasons or whatever. So those are the sort of positions that people kind of take. But often what's important um, underneath that is things like um, the need for recognition, the need for you know, people having worked really, really hard in challenging times and done everything they can in their sort of own um, kind of personal circumstances, or a need for um, you know, a feeling to, to, to belong um, or concerns over their sort of privacy and health and, and, and this kind of thing. And you know, mediation is the perfect kind of forum for those kind of things to come out and be discussed and understood. Um, you know, and, and, and that's you know, where you're likely to find resolution or, 
or you know a, a, a better understanding and so on so you know I know I'm, I said I was a passionate convert um, but you know it, it is a perfect forum to discuss those kind of things and get them open in a way that you you just wouldn't and couldn't in a formal kind of process. Thank you Alison and Phil one last point on this one for me please. Yes, I, I, thanks. I, I actually take David's point that uh, it, it, you know the, that there has been uh, an element where people potentially feel isolated, and there's never one. There's never one golden rule, but I I I worry about this idea that we think that there are people who are not communicating outside of the the formal structures that we have. What I've seen is that there are, and and actually some of this is worrying that there are. Uh, uh, lots of forums uh, happening and group WhatsApp groups for members of staff in particular teams. And, and it's not that the conversations about whether a particular manager's behavior, you know, is get going unchallenged, but that the, but that the conversations are less obvious. Uh, so um, the communications between managers and reports are becoming outside of what would normally be considered in workspaces. So the WhatsApp groups talking about, did you, I can't believe she just said that to you. I can't believe that she's ignoring you. I can't, all of that is not happening in the chat room that's associated with the, and it's happening in real time. It's happening in the WhatsApp group that people are, are, are dealing with down there. So actually, I think that there are subversive ways of communication that are ensuring communication is much more timely, uh, that criticism is sometimes harsher um, and certainly not available to uh, people who potentially are the, um, are the, uh, are the objects of, of criticism um, for teams. But I think that that's um, I, I, knocking the edges off. I certainly see, I take David's point on that, um, but sometimes I think that there is an opportunity to sharpen some edges. But, yeah. Thank you. That's a really interesting point. And, and one of the things, of course, we have all got to grips with in the past year, if not before, uh, is the use of technology. And of course, WhatsApp is one of those ways of us um, to have those conversations. Um, so I'm, I'm going to turn to you, uh, Tracy, now again, please, because um, I mean, some employees can work in a hybrid manner. And as you've mentioned, obviously, some due to the nature of the work can't um and from your perspective how do you ensure that frontline workers and many of whom have had more adversity perhaps than some and, and uh, had their backs you know kind of metaphorically broken during the pandemic how do you ensure that they're not left out um and that, that if there's any opportunities from a fresh way of working that they can benefit from some of the greater flexibility or perhaps you know an improved um kind of work working environment um, I think that's the real challenge for us. So uh, given that uh, we are a, a local authority and the predominant part of our workforce has been front facing through the pandemic and, and we don't want to um, kind of make any judgments based on what somebody might have experienced through the pandemic because our experiences are very different whether we've been front facing or whether we've had the ability to work from home. But where we talk about the benefits of hybrid working and, and a lot of those benefits are focused on kind of greater flexibility and the uh, work life balance, we've had to be very considerate of the fact that that's just not possible for our social care teams, our domiciliary care teams, our, our school based teams and, and our waste crews and park crews, etc. So um, that has been a significant challenge for us. And, and what we don't want is to end up with a kind of disparate workforce where you've got some that are able to work in a hybrid working way and, and others that can't and, and therefore there's frustration between the groups because we want a collaborative working environment for all of our employees where they feel engaged and, and able to, uh, to put impact and involvement. So uh, really early doors, we've been putting out wellbeing surveys to all of our staff groups and, and held in engagement sessions. And it, it comes in on the points that Alison has made around early intervention, mediation, communication is, is really key, I think. So uh, those groups have put forward representatives that have been involved in the creation of draft hybrid strategies, because this is something we're looking at. It, it's um, something that we're looking at from April, as I said, 2022. Um, and, and their input and involvement has been key. So they may not be able to work from, from home and, and they may not be able to have the greater flexibility because there is still the requirement to, uh, from a caring perspective 
but actually are there other things that we could look at doing for those groups that are just as important or even more important to them and what does that look like so um you know we've, we've held a lot of focus groups and and well-being surveys with those teams to ask them what that looks like and how we can offer flexibility perhaps in a different way and it, and it all comes back to um Alison's point around early intervention and communication. So the hope is we get it right. I'm, I'm not suggesting we won't have conflicts moving forward in the future. We'd like to think that we don't. But the hope is that actually engaging with those groups to, to help us develop a strategy that works for us as a local authority with the understanding that we've got these different dynamics um, would stand us in good, in good stead moving forward. But also the understanding for the groups that support those teams that actually whilst there is flexibility there is still a requirement for them to work those times that are critical to us as a business to ensure we deliver for those communities so i hope that gives a kind of flavor of kind of where we are um in our discussions absolutely thank you and and it just goes to show that the hybrid working is a a kind of tool one of the mechanisms for changing the way that we work and 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 obviously well-being can sit across the top of that and there are other solutions to help aren't there so um I, but something that's come up time and time again you know we run a lot of events for the legal sector as you obviously know uh, and we've done some surveys with junior lawyers and and senior management um and one of the things that comes up time and time again is the request and the request to want to work from home and enjoy all the benefits that that we've had um however for junior practitioners as much as they want that there is then that double-edged sword of we want to feel that we're being developed and we need mentorship and if we're in the office uh, is our manager going to be in there and and this isn't so something that's exclusive to the legal sector it's in every single sector um and so i, I wanted to ask um alison first there are concerns that those working from home will be disadvantaged advantage in terms of career development i mean we may all have uh, i suppose the majority of us will have had that throughout our working careers and and appreciate the benefits of having someone nearby to turn to and to learn from um, and obviously they want access to training and that leads to potentially to claims of um you know discrimination if they feel that they've been disadvantaged so um, how can employers deal with concerns of any less favorable treatment um, raised by employees who are working from home compared to those who are in the office um, more often. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it leads neatly on from actually what uh, Tracy was sort of talking about there. I will leave David to talk about the law side of this, um, but um, you know, I think there's that need to, to communicate, um, to have that you know, real open and honest kind of um, communication and engagement with, uh, with employees. Um, and you know, acknowledge that there are these potential kind of issues, potential kind of problems, and so on, and engage with employees and staff in terms of well, what what can we do differently? Um, and I think you know, one of the um, things coming out of the pandemic, we'll, we'll call it post-pandemic, hopefully, um, you know, is is you know, we've all had to think in very new, different, challenging kind of ways, um, and and things are still evolving. Um, so I think the, the challenge for managers and employers is to sort of continue to be flexible uh, in terms of the, their ways of sort of thinking, um, you know, to be prepared to kind of think outside the box um, and, and to listen, um, you know, to, to, to what employees um, are, are, are saying. Um, so I think, it, you know, for me, it, it's really around that need for engagement, communication, um, where there are differences and, and uh, concerns that kind of arising, as, as Tracy said, you know, that early kind of intervention um, is, is, is absolutely key. I mean, it may be that there are not ways of finding things that kind of work, but I think if you've had that open, honest conversation and people have had that opportunity to kind of have their say and discuss and debate it, um, you're going to be in a far better place to either avoid or um, resolve um, differences of viewpoint and opinion that may arise. Thank you. Um, and David, some of the legal issues around this. Law, them. okay. <laughs> um, well, the starting point is, is in terms of use of the word discrimination, which legally speaking only applies to certain protected characteristics, 
race and sex and disability and so on. And the, the mere fact that you treat somebody who is working wholly or mainly from home less favorably than somebody who's in the office all the time is not legally discrimination. It may be unfair, it is less favorable treatment, it will generate industrial relations issues, but it's not by itself discrimination. It could be uh, if you do these things in such a way as to prejudice more women than men, if more women work from home than men, possibly because of child care responsibilities, potentially in relation to disability, if that's the reason for working at home. But actually, the legal issue is not that significant here. It is the employment relations question. And you, you have to address that, I think, by starting with whose choice was hybrid working anyway. As employee, if you elect to work from home for certain parts of the week or on certain days, you are making a decision which has consequences. And so the question is not, are there adverse consequences, but has the employer done what it reasonably can to mitigate those? Uh, and I do stress the word reasonable. There's no obligation on the employer to protect the employee from the consequences of their own choices. You just have to do what you can. So you might, for example, make sure that your internal training sessions are um, available to view through Zoom or something. You might obviously would need to ensure that any training materials were emailed to the person who was at home as well. But there isn't, there just isn't any way of substituting for the listening to people talk and seeing what other people do and the, the water cooler knowledge that you gain. You, you just can't do it. Uh, and if that's going to be such a big problem, then you should be thinking about saying no to hybrid working in the first place. Uh, now that, that comes back to the question I asked earlier, how big a problem do you need in order to say no? And we'll skip lightly over that for the moment. But you, you don't have to protect an employee from those consequences. You do what you can. So you talk to them a lot about the things they think they're missing out on. You, the, you, they may or may not be right about that. There is a, a feeling often that the office is more busy and more fun and more educational than is really the case. And you, you touched on a very good point that the juniors might go in to learn from the seniors, but if the seniors aren't there in the first place, it, it's all rather a frost one way or the other. But talk particularly. Uh, what can we do? What can we reasonably do? We're not going to repeat conversations just because you weren't there. Uh, we're not going to run separate training sessions for the people who aren't in because that's cost and inc material cost and inconvenience to us. But we will do what we can. And if you, employee, think that you know better, then for heaven's sake, tell us. Tell us what we could do. We won't necessarily agree, but you have to have that consultation in the first place. And if you do that, and despite that, a generation of juniors in whatever business you're in begins to feel that it's being adrift to some extent, well, then that's a, a structural problem which could ultimately lead you to have to unwind all the, the hybrid working arrangements. But it, it's, unfortunately, it's an individual question. It's not a generic question. And different individuals learn in different ways and experience in different ways and have different days of the week when they'd want to be homeworking and so on, which may clash or coincide with your internal training programme. You can't produce a generic answer to that one beyond if the employer does what it reasonably can, it'll be fine. Thank you very much. Um, I, and I, I like that idea of giving confidence back to employers as well. And I suspect that's some 
um, we'll be looking for that. Um, and just before we move on, um, Phil, is there anything you wanted to kind of comment on, on this particular issue at all? Uh, no, just to agree with, with David, there is that reasonableness test, isn't there? And I think that that's, that's really important. Um, um, but I also like what he said about having conversations and being an individual. Um, and what we often get is a backlash to an announcement of this is how it's going to be from now on. Um, and of course, we know that announcements like that often are then uh, uh, applied to individual circumstances in different ways. That's fine. That's absolutely fine to set out a principle um, and then to adjust those you know, in reasonable circumstances is fine. But I wonder what was the purpose then of that, uh, of the edict from the top saying, this is how it's going to be from now on. Um, and, and I suppose thinking about mediation and thinking about having mediation skills, Alison's point earlier about mediation skills are our toolkit skills for every leader and manager. And, and having those conversations early on are going to be important because that's how you will know what your what the makeup of your team um, is is saying and what 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 they think the solutions to some of the issues that potentially might be early on so the edicts become less draconian and I think that's that's key for, for new business I think. Thank you very much, um, Phil. We've discussed this um, offline before before the event, so I'm going to come back to you on this. I'm afraid um, there um, th there is a concern um, that employees working remotely feel like they don't belong, um, and the word isolated gets banded around. But I think there's also um, the idea of belonging, which could impact motivation, a cohesive organisational culture, um, obviously the well-being and and the delivery of, of, of the performance as well of their work. Um, and I just wondered if an employee raises a complaint that they feel like they don't belong, uh, and I suspect others might want to come in on this, what options does an employer have to resolve such complaints? But, but you might want to talk a little bit about that sense of belonging. Well, the options for resolving such complaints, um, let's, let's deal with that one first, because I think that's the, that's the real headline, isn't it? And the options are early mediation, early conversations, and where conversations are getting stuck, early mediation, um, the whole idea of performance um, improvement plans and, 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 and managing out staff that have different, different um, uh, needs and interests, it, it, it's, I always think is going to be problematic for a company in a long term or an organisation in a long term. Um, so trying to address those early on, I think, is going to be really important. Uh, and I also um, have to agree with David on, on some, some points. Um, uh, and, and Tracy's experience, I'm sure, will come into this as well. But the c communication and involvement is going to be key. Now, the, how you communicate and how you get involved in departments and organisations is different. And certainly in our sector, our reliance on information technology, considering, you know, uh, universities are supposed to be cutting edge and they're supposed to be leading front and having access to all of the knowledge in the world. Um, and and should, we should have been able to resolve issues you know with the, with the, the brain power that allegedly exists in universities we should have solved this issue before it even became an issue the reality is is that we hadn't as a sector invested in information technology we were forced to do it in a very um a very quick way and there was a lot of upskilling of administrative staff and of, of education and teaching staff and research staff that had to happen in a very short space of time um now we've got a better infrastructure. We've got bigger bandwidths, so or you can see I didn't attend to all of the training because I'm just about to talk a little about that. But you know, we have green rooms where we can, or green screen rooms where we can do our, our lectures in a different way. We have risen to the challenge and we know that we've got more to go. But that upskilling, that uh, investment in infrastructure allows people to interact with each other in different ways. And it's working out how an organization is able to use the resources to, um, uh, to, to interact. So I'll give you a very quick example of a new starter at, a, at an organization, which isn't mine, I shall say, but um, there, is, there was a mixture of on-site and uh, hybrid workers um, during an induction. And part of this induction involved um, a, a lunch, they were taken out to lunch, um, and that, that went on for three hours. Um, and what happened is all of those on site went off to Nando's and they spent three hours in Nando's and they were team building and they were 
looking at members and all of those kind of things. And those that were hybrid workers and those that were home workers were left at home, not sure how long the lunch is going to be, sat at their computers and waiting for everyone to come back. Um, and there are some very pragmatic approaches. Having a lunch in the office, having Zoom, having, you know, kind of the Zoom party, if you like. I mean, it's, is it ideal? It's not. But it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's about including and using technology and using alternative ways. And it could have been that there could have been an offer of coming down for the lunch, coming down for that day. Uh, let's put you up somewhere. Let's, I mean, it's a big organization with, you know, decent resource. Um, but, uh, you know, all of those things could have happened. But it was a bit like, this is what we always did pre-pandemic. So we're going to do this and we'll just get back to you working at home. That's the afterthought. The, the other interesting question is when complaints happen, by the time a complaint comes in, people have already fished for the evidence that supports their initial idea. So do you remember that time where I had to sit in my computer for two hours because I thought lunch was going to be an hour and nobody told me? That's, that's the evidence that shows that you have treated me less favorably, whereas it needn't have happened in the first place, uh, but not, but it ought to, but you know, retrospective interpretation of events comes to, this is the evidence that I've got that I've been treated less fa favorably, probably not uh, something that would have been on their mind pre-complaint or pre a long series of, of issues that will come through. So use the technology you got. The technology has to be there in order for you to work remotely in, in most cases. So it's about what technology have I got? How can I increase in this? How can I use this in inclusive in an inclusive way as opposed to doing what we always did? Um, so that's um, that, that's my mumblings on that, I have to say. Thank you. And it's actually a really good example um, that was given. And I've experienced something similarly uh, some recently when I was holding a hybrid event in person. And uh, and it's so easy to forget, I suppose, or not deal with the online audience in the same way, especially if you have for such a long time and then suddenly they're an afterthought. So I think that's um, that that's really important. Um, send a muffin bucket back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's small things. I think people did it a lot, but it's as we re go, we're going back into it. A more familiar world it's making sure we don't step, step back into kind of old habits um tracy um i know that you're oh, tight on time as well is there anything you wanted to add on this sense of, of belonging um at all or any of the um kind of the remedies um, <clears throat> no, nothing additional in what's just been said other than i don't think we can underestimate the importance because I think that's what's going to set us apart as we kind of open up to a kind of more hybrid way of working, which it looks like it at least is going to be with us for some time, isn't it? So, um, and it's how we as organisations engage with our staff groups um, to make them feel that they belong. Um, and that's the acid test, I think, for all of us at the moment in terms of how we're going to look to do that. So we're certainly looking at things like our accommodation spaces to ensure we've got sort of more creative and innovative hubs because there's not the opportunity for spontaneous discussion as, as there would have been before and um, we're holding more virtual kind of uh, what we're calling learning cafes and um, and feedback sessions from a uh, employee engagement perspective and, and we're holding those both online and where possible within a covid safe way within an office space and, and we're not precluding anything either so, you know, if somebody feels that they actually do still want to come into an office space uh, when, you know, the Welsh Government guidance changes to, to ensure that that is the case, then we will accommodate that. Um, so, you know, we're not being restrictive or, um, uh, you know, precluding people just because actually the, the majority of what people are saying is, is, is perhaps the way to go. Thank you very much. Um, and, and not solely to, to both Alice and David, but in particular, um, if there is a dispute arising from a refusal to agree to go to remote working or to move to this hybrid model, how best can an employer approach this and what might help prevent such disputes arising? I suspect I know what you're going to say, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth for one minute. So, Alison, I'd like to um, ask you to join us on that one. Okay, thank you. I, I think I think some of this we've talked about uh, already, but um, I think the main point I'd like to kind of make here is that 
you know, wh where there is a dispute or, or a conflict arising uh, in, in, in relation to this or anything else, my, my um, overall advice is, you know, don't go straight to the formal process. Um, you know, there are those early intervention kind of options that we've already talked about, the early um, conversation, um, early mediation. Um, and we also, do, I'm not sure it's totally relevant in this context, but we also do um, things like sort of conflict coaching. So helping people themselves manage the conflict, um, empower them to think about how they might resolve it uh, and so on you know, some form of um, informal facilitation or intervention. And, and your last resort is your formal process. Well, actually, your, your last resort is David in a, in, in a legal uh, context. But, you know, those formal um, internal or legal processes, you know, really are um, your sort of last uh, ditch option. Um, and I, I think it also links to what people were sort of saying about, you know, we, we, we need to be clear that this is, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all. There is, a, there is that need for that individual kind of consideration in terms of people's kind of specific um, personal kind of situations and so on. Um, you know, and, and, you know, going through a formal process is, 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 is not gonna help that. It, it's not gonna help, you know, the discussion around um, how you can adapt whatever the sort of general kind of edict is uh, or policy is and, and, and so on um, in, in the same way that informal um, resolution will do. So I would just really encourage people to, um, you know, try to resolve things at this early, early stage uh, without reference to any kind of sort of formal process um, and, and use that in, in informal kind of mechanism first. Thank you. I really um, love the idea of, of the conflict coaching as well. And I, I'll, I'll try and get some information from you on that, Alison, and put that on um, when we share the recording as well. Um, and David, um, a couple of points from you on this, please. Yes, I've always seen myself as a distressed purchase, but, but uh, there you go. I think actually Alison's answered that question. So the points I'd want to make are in relation to the one before, in, in relation to people who are hybrid working and say they don't feel they belong. At risk of sounding very non-mediator-like, there is an obvious answer to that, which is we'll come back into the office then. Uh, and that's something which ultimately the employer can say. Of course, you start with, what do you think you're missing out on? Why don't you feel you belong? And you can flush that out as far as you can. And if they are behavioral issues then you can deal with them if it is everybody spent three hours in nando's and that's seen as a benefit uh, then of course the the simple answer is just to say sorry and until you get to the suggestion that hybrid workers are being treated less favorably deliberately then we come back to these are just consequences of choices and we'll do what we can but we're not perfect and we never will be. And ultimately, employee, it is for you to decide whether this works for you, whether the, the occasional completely unintentional snub is tolerable in return for the quality of life benefits that you get. That is, that is your decision. Uh, I, I can't add to anything Alison said in relation to what if there's a dispute because yes try and talk about it of course in the end the law underpinning that is very simple it's either workable or it's not and if having talked about it you can't make it work then you can say no uh, and if that doesn't persuade the employee you can talk about it some more but in the end somebody's going to go and find somebody like me which is extremely regrettable all round uh, but but that that's essentially it that there is a lot of scope for talking and for mediation and consultation around hybrid working and you have to hope it works because once you're into the law on this it gets lengthy and expensive and stressful and relationships which were already damaged are completely destroyed Thank you. Um, and that is the fear. And 
um, from what I've read up on the subject in an event we hosted uh, about, probably about four months ago um, on hybrid working, which was the idea of experimenting and seeing what works for you and, and you know, keep talking about it. And you might have to say, well, that's sorry, that's not working. Let's try something else. That kind of is a, a juxtaposition with the idea of, well, is this going to get us into a legal uh, mess if we, if we experiment too much um, and how we deal with that? So um, I suspect um, that, you know, it's about that confidence, isn't it, to be able to, and how, and how you're communicating is what I'm picking up from, from all of the speakers today um, and how you're share, you know, engaging people through that process. Um, um, just before um, I come back to Alison, I appreciate we're close on time. We will try and extend the next one. Has anybody from the audience got a question or um, anything to kind of add or comment on uh, while uh, we have our panelists here? I haven't seen anything in the chat. It's, it's not a problem. If not, there's been lots covered and I appreciate it's a quite sensitive subject that people may not want to share um, their own experiences either. Um, but if you have, um, I, I'm, well, just if you want to have a think, I'm just going to hand over to Alison um, just to um, introduce the Civil Mediation Council uh, as we haven't done so at the beginning of the event um, and also to, um, to, to thank everybody as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I could take the opportunity just one last little um, kind of comment. Um, I think this is threaded through what we've all sort of talked about, but it, it comes back to um, something I said in my introduction about managers and leaders having conflict uh, resolution skills. A lot of what we've talked about comes back to the quality of the conversation um, and the skill uh, and ability, uh, capability um, to have those difficult conversations uh, and, and in particular to have those difficult conversations rather than avoid them, which is often uh, what um, kind of happens in practice. So I just wanted to make that final point. Um, uh, firstly, I just wanted to um, thank um, uh, my fellow panelists. So Phil, Tracy and David, thank you very much for your contributions and, and your time. It really is um, very much appreciated. Um, and I just wanted to finish off just by well, and, and thanking um, our, our lovely host Emma as well, um, and for um, you know uh, you collaborating with these uh, with these webinars. Um, and then I just finally want to just say a little bit about the Civil Mediation Council. Um, the aim of the Civil Mediation Council is, um, in in very kind of highlight terms. Uh, to sort of raise awareness of mediation, which obviously this um, series of webinars is very much a part of, and also to sort of raise standards uh, and so on. Um, I head up the Civil Mediation Council um, Welsh region, if we co can call it that. Um, we do have sort of regular meetings. Um, so if anybody in the audience is interested in finding out more about the Civil Mediation Council, or what we're doing sort of locally or nationally, um, please do get in touch. Um, you know, we, we, we'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, and, and, and look out for um, future events. We've got the, the, the two, more, two, two more webinars in this series, but you know, there will be future events uh, of, of you know, other, other things as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Alison. And those two events, the next one is the grievance uh, is dead. Should mediation be mandatory? Uh, that's on the 7th of December, and I will send you all a booking link for that later today. Uh, and also our next one, which is team conflict on the rise, how to manage uh, how to positively manage um, to avoid uh, disputes um, and that will be in, on the 20th of January so we'll give you a little bit of time over Christmas and we'll then share some of the recordings um, uh, in January as well. Um, if anybody has any questions to me or any contact details required in the meantime please let me know um, but otherwise thank you again to all of our speakers to Alison um, and to you all for attending and I hope to see you at the next one. Take care, thank you.